Well, good morning. Welcome to the WISTEC webinar training number four for this year. So I'm very excited today to welcome our speakers, Brian Norton and Josh Anderson, all the way from Indiana, coming today to talk about job accommodations and on the fly accommodations. So just a little bit of housekeeping. So this webinar is brought to you by WISTEC, Wisconsin's Assistive Technology Act program, which is part of the Department of Health Services. And we are using the webinar platform today, which does mean that your cameras and your mics are automatically turned off. You are welcome to use the chat function, which many of you already have, as well as the Q&A for any questions, comments, um, sharing of ideas throughout today's webinar. This is a two hour webinar. It will be recorded, as you are aware, and it will be archived on the WISTEC AT Council YouTube channel. That usually takes a few weeks, um, but it will be up there. We do have sign language interpreters available that you are welcome to pin, as well as closed captioning. We are offering CRC, which is Certified Rehab Counselor Credits, and CEUs which are eligible for your ATP or your physical therapy, occupational therapy, et cetera. So in order to get those certificates, you will need to complete the survey that will pop up both at the end of today's webinar, as well as in the reminder email tomorrow. And then you'll answer a couple questions as well as provide feedback about today's session and then within 30 days, you will get your certificates for your CRC and your CEUs. Um, I believe that is the rest of our housekeeping. So um, again, I am super grateful for Brian and Josh for joining today. I had the opportunity to see this session last January um, or February down in Orlando and just very creative solutions, um, and I think we'll really give you confidence on kind of just coming up with things as you're working with people and finding solutions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian and Josh and let them take it away. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Laura, for uh, inviting us to be a part of this series. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, thinking about us. This is a topic um, for Josh and I that we're pretty passionate about. Um, we're going to be talking about on-the-fly accommodations or really job accommodations um, as we go throughout this day. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda um, and we are really hoping for uh, a lot of participation from you um, as our audience. And so uh, be active in the chat. If you guys have questions as we go through, feel free to jump in and just put those questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring those. Uh, you can also put those in the Q&A and we'll keep an eye on that as we go through it today. So um, we do, um, just to kind of walk you through the agenda a little bit, um, obviously every time we present, we want to kind of level set folks and give people an understanding of who we are. So we'll do some intros, uh, hear a little bit about who we are, our background, why we're so passionate about this particular topic. Um, we'll talk about the accommodation process, the why, the what, the who, the when, the how, uh, all of those things that go into that process um, to make a successful accommodation for folks. Uh, and we'll talk about hiccups and glitches. Hiccups and glitches happen along the way. Um, there's always hurdles that you have to overcome in the accommodation process, so we don't want to leave those out um, and, and work from a mindset where everything works well every time we go out, and it's always kind of this wonderful experience. Sometimes it can get a little bit more challenging um, and a little bit more difficult, and so we'll talk about some of those common hiccups and glitches, um, how, to, how to overcome some of those and what to do about some of those, um, how to approach those. And then we're gonna get into this interactive brainstorming activity. Um, a lot of, most of the time we do this, pre we do this presentation in person with folks. Um, and we, as Laura mentioned, we break out into groups and we kind of problem solve and we come back to the bigger group and we try to kind of talk through solutions. Um, today we're gonna be do it a little bit differently since we're all online. Um, and so really relying on people's participa participation today and kind of coming up with um, different scenarios. We have scenarios um, already listed out um, and then really coming up with some accommodations and brainstorming together about solutions for these particular um, situations. 
And then lastly, um, I never want to leave a presentation without providing resources um, to folks where folks can turn um, if they're stuck and, and they need to be able to figure something out. And so uh, we have different resources for folks um, that we'll talk through as well. So without further ado, I'm going to kind of just start with kind of telling you a little bit about who we are. Um, and so I'll start with myself and let Josh jump in here in just a moment as well. And so I'm, as, she, as Laura mentioned earlier, we're from Indiana. Um, we're the in data program, uh, and um, we also have a clinical assistive technology program as well. Uh, and so I'm the director of assistive technology here at Easter Seals Crossroads. Uh, my first job out of college was a job coach. Um, so I started in our employment programs. We, we have a pretty large employment program where we help folks with disabilities find jobs. Uh, and that's where I got my start as a job coach, helping folks, you know, it make get ready for interviews and prepare for, you know, meeting jobs and, and working with employers and kind of working out that relationship between the employee and the employer and making sure things are going well and making sure that we have a successful accommodation. And so after a couple of years of being a job coach, I moved into assistive technology um, and have been here ever since. And so I think the slide's a little old. It's 26 years now um, uh, in our AT program. And um, as you can imagine, it's it's a rewarding program. Um, it's a rewarding thing to be a part of, getting to see people do something that they didn't think they would be able to do, um, and really kind of problem solving and fixing and, and addressing issues that come up uh, all the time. And so super excited to be here with you guys today. And I'm Josh Anderson. So I manage our clinical assistive technology services. So that's kind of uh, just another side of our program. So where Brian is over in data, which is the AT Act provider here for Indiana, uh, my team actually goes out and works with individuals for workplace accommodations, uh, different assistive technology interventions, and really just helps people with disabilities really maximize their potential and be able to be uh, productive and successful on the job in college and with other kinds of needs. I also started as a job coach. Unlike Brian, this was not my first job out of college. I think I got a job as a job coach because I had had every other job possible by that time. Um, but uh, then about 10 years ago, after much like him, about two years in, a, in employment, I did move into AT and just never really looked back. So love talking about this stuff, love kind of uh, doing it, do still get to see some workplace accommodations firsthand, even managing the team. So that's great. And then I also host uh, Assistive Technology Update, which is one of our three podcasts on assistive technology uh, that we do here through our team at Easter Seals Crossroads. Excellent. And so um, what I want to do first is kind of just level set people's understanding. We're going to talk a little bit about what is an accommodation um, and then move on from there. And so when you look up the definition for an accommodation, I'll put it a little bit more simply than what you might find in, you know, the laws or um, other places. Um, by the way, are you guys getting any feedback from my mic? No. Okay, good because it's a little bit in my ear. Um, anyways, so yeah, level set folks understanding of accommodations. And so really an accommodation is any change in the work environment or in the way that people do something, customarily do something that enables an individual with a disability to enjoy equal opportun employment opportunities. And what I wanna encourage folks to think about is think a little bit more broad. Um, it's not just once a person's on the job and they're doing their job and the tasks that they have, this is, a, this is across the employee life cycle. Um, so as employers go out there and they try to attract um, folks to their business, you know, making sure that their websites are accessible so that folks can learn about who they are, specifically folks with disabilities who might use assistive technology, making sure that your application process is more accessible, um, that there are tools or accommodations that can be made. As you start to recruit folks, you may consult with folks, make it an open conversation with folks as they apply and ask them, are there any necessary accommodations that will be needed in the interview or the pre-employment testing? A lot of places put people through testing and making sure that those tests, whether it's computer related or other, um, that there are accommodations for folks to be able to kind of do those and be successful with those. Uh, thinking about the onboarding of folks, having open conversations early on about reasonable accommodations. What do they need to be able to do the different tasks that are a part of the job that they're applying for or that they're starting, uh, making them feel welcome and supported. You can also go into retention, you know, offering flexible work hours or locations for folks to work from. 
adjustments to the technology or software or hardware that they're using to be able to do their job. Um, and then really even beyond that development, you know, we all do ongoing training. Um, training happens in multiple ways. You know, it could be in person, it could be online. Um, and online today we have ASL interpreters and we have a captioner. Uh, having those things available for folks should they need those types of accommodations as you're offering training and ongoing um, learning in that for that particular position. So it's one thing to be able to accommodate someone for a very specific task on the job. Um, and that's typically when we get involved um, as we go out to employers and meet with folks, they've already got a job, we're looking at what do they need to do? And we're trying to ad address those particular tasks that they're, ha they're struggling with or having difficulty with. Um, but I think it's, it's even more important for employers to think more broadly, um, um, stretch the mind a little bit from how are you attracting people? How are you recruiting? What's your onboarding process look like? If something happens or, or um, someone experiences disability while they already have the job, what's your retention? How, how do you address that? What's the development opportunities for folks? And so thinking broadly about that employee life cycle and addressing accommodations uh, along the way. In my mind, this isn't really anything new. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, if you look at the top, you're gonna see goose or geese, um, and then you can look at the bottom, you'll see fish, yet they're the same superimposed image there. Um, I'm, I'm, I argue that accommodations really aren't all that new for folks. I think most employers already offer accommodations. They might just not know it. Um, any, again, if you think about the definition, it's any change in the particular person's environment. How often do we let folks do it their own way? Um, I encourage my folks, like we have a report writing process, you know, do the report your own way, put your own spin on it. As long as it's getting the job done, that's what I care about as the employer. Um, I just wanna make sure that the job gets done um, and you can do it in your own way. Um, so think about the ways that you might um, have done stuff in your job and or for the folks who work for you. You know, if anybody's ever done something differently to do or to stay or to be able to accomplish a task, you know, you've accommodated that particular task for a particular person. Um, and so thinking about broadly, you know, all the things that we do at work, what do we do? How do we do it? Um, if you've done something differently, maybe it wasn't the standard way to do it, yet it got the job done. You really made an accommodation for yourself or for others. Um, simple versus complex. Um, I think it's really important for folks to realize whether you're in an HR office, you're in a health and safety office, um, or part of that organization, you know, a lot of accommodations are pretty simple and straightforward. You know, uh, meeting with folks, maybe raising a desk so that they can get their wheelchair up and underneath a particular um, a desk that's, that's at their workplace color coding a task list to help folks with maybe intellectual developmental disabilities or other cognitive needs be able to accomplish and get through what they need to do that particular day or offering a keyboard or mouse, an adaptive keyboard or mouse, should a standard keyboard or mouse not really work or be that efficient for somebody to use um, for their daily tasks. Then there's the other accommodations. And this is a lot of times when folks like Josh or myself and or um, teams like that we have in our clinical program get involved. Um, there are going to be some accommodations that you'll come across that are just gonna be more complex. So that depending on the nature of the disability, maybe it's the situation that's being accommodated or the tool or solution being implemented um, or really other factors that may be there as well, they're gonna require a little bit more knowledge and understanding of disability and or problem solving, being able to kind of think outside the box, um, come up with other solutions, be able to address particular needs. Uh, we encourage folks in our program, um, and especially when we talk to businesses, direct business to business types of accommodations, and we do work with lots of different employers directly, you know, that in their HR and within their, safe, their health and safety teams, Let's talk about it. Let's come up with and, and really brainstorm and offer um, consulting in those situations. However, there's a lot of times where we do need to get more into the weeds with individuals and really understand exactly the nature of the disability, the situation that they're being accommodated for or the tool or solution that's being implemented and making sure that that technology or that that solution is really gonna solve that need. And so we have to get in the weeds. We have to start meeting with folks and um, it becomes a part of that accommodation process.
So really, whether the the situation is is simple or complex, and depending upon how much you're doing, cost is always kind of a, a factor that does have to be taken into account. A lot of times, these accommodations, evaluations, and other things may be paid for by public funds or by the employer, uh, workman's comp, so many different places. So when you're considering accommodations, you do have to kind of do the, the Cadillac versus Chevy test. Uh, and this isn't where you take two cars out and race them down the street. Um, it's just more kind of the thought process of if I need a car to drive, uh, a Cadillac and a Chevy would both get me there. One's just more expensive, got more bells and whistles, but both can accomplish the same tasks. So when it comes to evaluations, and hopefully we get to practice this some uh, as we, we go into the scenarios later, but there's really no magic bullet. Uh, it'd be great if there really was that, you know, I have an employer, an individual with a disability with this need, and there's just this magic thing that absolutely helps them. Brian and I probably wouldn't have jobs if that was true, but the world would be much more accommodating. So it would be really great. So a lot of times there's different accommodations that can accomplish the same goal. One way to really kind of help find what works best for the individual is to really use the local tech acts to really try out different accommodations, to be able to get things in someone's hands uh, or in their environment, in the system that they're going to be using to see what works, as well as to see what they actually like using. Uh, and a lot of times this can be accomplished, again, by borrowing things from your local tech act or seeing if maybe there's a free or trial version. Uh, depending on the need, if it's an app, a computer program, a Google Chrome extension, all these different things. A lot of times there's a free version or 14 days free trial and some other things that might be able to assist with those. Sometimes the built-ins or open source programs can even assist. I always kind of start there. If I'm meeting with somebody and accessing the computer at work is an issue, well, you know, can we access the keyboard? Do we just need sticky keys or some other program that's already built in there in order to be able to do a little bit more? So it really is just kind of using what's all there to begin with to see what's really going to meet the individual's needs. And with that, more expensive doesn't always mean better. Uh, there are some AT interventions out there that are thousands and thousands, and I could probably keep on going on, thousands of dollars. Uh, some of these are necessary, though. Uh, from time to time, that is the accommodation that is needed to meet that need. Other times, there may be a free app that does the same thing, or some other readily available technology, be it consumer uh, or actually assistive technology that can meet that need. And with that same thing, free doesn't always necessarily mean bad. There have been times we've went out to do workplace accommodations, and instead of writing up a report and having all these great recommendations, we enable a few things on the computer, teach the person how to use it, and that was the only need. So it's pretty much done. Uh, so free isn't always bad. Always try to kind of start there. But really most important is ensure that all the needs are accommodated. We'll talk about this a little bit more as we get into the process, but when it comes to workplace accommodations, it's not really, the disability is not the most important part. It is where is the barrier? Where does the individual have a problem accessing things? What's keeping them from being successful? And the answer isn't their disability. It's usually access or, or being able to use the tools that are there. Another thing is do not overwhelm. There is a, uh, especially kind of for newer folks, at least on my team, that, wow, there's 300 things that can help this individual with each one of these tasks and every single thing. Uh, I can tell you that if you implement too much, you're really just creating another barrier. So you really want to make sure that the individual has the equipment and the training on that to meet all of the needs to accommodate all the things that they have to do on the job, but also make it as easy as possible to do that so that you don't get overwhelmed. And you're not just putting another barrier to success in place while trying to accommodate the ones you're trying to accommodate. Excellent. Um, talking about simple versus complex. I mean, obviously, every situation you walk into is going to be a little different. Um, and what we often find is uh, we always start with simple. 
um, finding simple ways that we can kind of address particular situations. And so here on the screen, we've got blocks of wood. I think I may have mentioned this in a previous on a previous slide, but blocks of wood can be an accommodation for someone as you lift up a desk or a piece of furniture. Whether that's, again, having someone be able to pull a wheelchair up and underneath a desk and or maybe making things more accessible to folks who are in a wheelchair or who can't stoop or bend or, or sit down or get down to the floor um, very easily. Raising things up to a particular height is easy. Um, it's, le it's pretty inexpensive um, and it goes a long way um, for folks. And so sometimes an accommodation is just buying some wood, cutting it to size, and making sure that it's put and placed properly um, at the work site. Thinking about all of those things about safety and other types of things when you do that. However, it could be as simple as a block of wood. Here's one that I got from a VR counselor here in Indiana that I thought was very creative and unique. Um, she actually implemented a cup koozie um, in a unique way um, for an individual um, who worked in a cubicle environment. Uh, and his job entailed answering the phone a lot. Uh, and so when he would answer the phone, being in that cubicle environment, he had a really hard time understanding who was on the other line um, because of his disability, being able to key in on what's being said and understand that well when there's all that background noise in his environment. Um, and so what this particular VR counselor had done is they cut the cup koozie in half and then they put it over the talking part of your hand receiver that was on his phone. Um, and when he would do that, it would do a pretty good job of negating all of that background noise that was create or overhead noise that was creating a lot of issues for him being able to understand folks and allowed him to be able to hear people more clearly when he was talking on the phone. Again, a pretty simple accommodation um, that didn't cost really anything. You can pick up a cup koozie from most corner convenience stores or gas stations, those types of things, and made a big difference for this particular individual um, at his job. I guess it helps if I unmute. Uh, so going on to, to kind of the more complex ones, so ones that maybe have a few more needs or there's some more things to accommodate. Uh, this one was an individual who was hard of hearing. Uh, they worked at a Starbucks uh, as a barista. So if you've ever been in there, uh, it, it can be a pretty loud place. You've got the the steam coming out of the machine. You've got the grinders. You've got people talking. You've got, it seems like 25 people working behind the counter from time to time. So you've got a lot of noise and a lot of different things. So due to their uh, hard of hearing, they had a very hard time just hearing when timers and alerts went off. So when the, the steam milk was done, when the coffee was ground, when the espresso was poured, and also when people came up through the drive through line, if you've ever worked any kind of restaurant kind of job that has a drive through, there's usually a ding uh, whenever you get it. And the ding was just uh, not quite loud enough to really give all the information that they needed. So a couple of different kind of accommodations for this. Uh, one was just a Nest camera, and this was, uh, you can get these pretty much anywhere. They're just a regular consumer good. But what they do, uh, if you'd use the outdoor model, is whatever a car would pull up, it would see it and it would send an alert. That alert was just set up to the person's phone, so they would have a vibration and know that someone was at the drive through line. Uh, especially for times when there weren't as much staff there, there wasn't somebody to just kind of watch it, and you want them to be able to work independently. Other things were ring extenders. So what these do are they pick up noise and kind of send that information to another piece. So really what we were doing was changing sound into vibrations and, and other kinds of alerting uh, devices so that the individual would know when different things were ready, could stay on task, and really could work just as productively and well as anyone else in the entire place. So uh, with that, it's just kind of replacing one sensory input with another one in order to make it to where they could all do uh, everything the same. Ah, oh, thank you. Like next slide, please. Uh, <laughs> another kind of complex, sometimes it's not always as complex by uh, the amount of different things that are needed to be accommodated, but also just because disability does not live in a vacuum, just because I have perhaps 
uh, one disability does not mean I'm immune from all the others. So this uh, individual worked at a, a pizza parlor. So if you've ever kind of seen that, you know, there's all kinds of ovens and cutting and answering the phone, just lots of different things that kind of kind of go into it. This individual had a, a visual impairment and was short of stature. So uh, and not very tall, I think probably four foot or less, perhaps I'm not, I, I can't quite remember completely, but kind of some difficulties were, you know, making and cutting pizzas, breadsticks, and other foods, not just because of height, but also if you really think if you're, if you're kind of shorter of stature, uh, getting leverage sometimes can be a bit of a challenge as well. So in order to accommodate, you can see a few things there. I mean, one thing extremely easy is just a step stool, one that can be brought around, one that's not always sitting in the same place, because as you think about workplace accommodations, you need to also make sure that those accommodations don't cause issues for every other person in there. So if you just put something stationary there by a work area, everyone else is just going to trip on it and it's going to become an actual kind of barrier to their success at work. So a movable stool, the person could take it wherever they need it. Uh, you can actually see, and I don't think this was the actual device, but this pizza cutter uh, is available and there's a few different models of it where it can, instead of making one swipe, can make three or four at the same time. So with a stool that could get up higher, could use that and actually cut breadsticks, pizzas and other things a whole lot quicker. The other thing that's not on here that it doesn't say is the individual was an iPhone user. Uh, so they also use the Seeing AI app in order to read uh, receipts, orders, and things like that, just to make sure they were making the pizzas correctly, putting everything together correctly, and could actually have voice feedback for that printed information. So, um, and even when it says complex, as we kind of talk about those, those Chevys and and Cadillac, Seeing AI was a free app. And I think total, if you take all the different devices, including the stool, you're probably looking at a little over $100, probably in all of those accommodations. So uh, still not super expensive, even if you are implementing some different things in order to assist. And I'm pretty sure, and you'll see this probably sometimes in accommodations, that that individual is not the only one that uses that cutter. Uh, I think other people there found that it sped them up and made it it work a lot better for them as well. So you will see that sometimes as you put something in place to help one individual, an employer will look and go, well, heck, that can help everybody here. And next thing you know, the, the whole place is using the same thing. Excellent. And I think it's important to kind of think about, you know, when we do talk about simple versus complex, um, it doesn't always have to be about money. Um, it doesn't always mm -hmm. have to be about cost. Um, sometimes, you know, it could be just it's more complex because of the nature of the disability that there are multiple disabilities going on and the disability is playing off the particular task that needs to be done and or the solution. So it's just a more complex situation. Um, and so um, thinking about some of these scenarios, again, to Josh's point, this didn't cost a lot. It was just a lot to think through uh, based on that person's need for things that could help with vision, mobility, stability, leverage, those kinds of things. And so, um, again, when you walk into an accommodation, you're kind of walking in without a whole lot of knowledge and really forethought about what's going on because everybody, um, every situation is a little unique, which leads us into our next slide, which is, uh, again, always remember one size doesn't fit all. Um, I think who's on our call today um, probably understands this. Um, but I think it's always important to kind of reiterate and restate um, as many times as we can, because I don't think that's kind of the overall view uh, when you think about um, folks with disabilities. You know, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, and we can go down the line with disabilities. And so um, always remembering that one size doesn't fit all. We all have our different likes, our different preferences, the way we like to do things. Um, and so it's really important every time you walk into the door to get to know the individual, understand what their disability is, understand the different tasks that they're trying to do, um, but then also really get to know what are your preferences? What do you like to do? Or how do you like to do things? Um, and, and really get to know them um, at a little bit more lower level um, so that you can um, really fully um, address, implement, and, and understand uh, where they're coming from each and every time that you do an accommodation. So 
spending a little bit of time talking about why do we provide accommodations? Uh, and I think, again, based on who's on our call, I would think that folks would gather some of this stuff. But again, it's always good to reiterate and restate these types of things. And I think we all know, you know, disability in the workplace, um, the different statistics that are out there. Um, I, I don't know what the most current, these are the things that I have. Um, uh, one in five Americans have 20%. I think that's probably lower than what it really is uh, because baby boomers are getting older, they're developing age-related disabilities, and whether it's a more of a traditional disability or an age-related disability, the needs and the issues are still the same. Um, we still have difficulty with vision, mobility, intellectual, cognitive needs, and those kinds of things. And so um, a lot of folks just don't identify as having a disability yet, um, yet that may be um, something that they are struggling with. <clears throat> So again, statistically speaking, one in five Americans, about 20% of Americans have disabilities. And again, if you think about who's employed, uh, people with disabilities and their employment, as of 2017, I think that statistic has been revi revised more recently, but back in 2017, um, it's about 18.7% of people with disabilities are employed. And if you think about the workplace, and we can attest to it as we try to hire assistive technology specialists and other things, other folks here, uh, you know, it is a very large pool of folks um, who are out there um, who are ready, willing, and able. They have all the skills and the abilities that an organization might need um, that, that could make a really viable pool of talent um, for the folks who are employers to expand their talent pool. Um, if they're willing to make accommodations for them once they're on the job. Um, you'll also find that research shows persons with disabilities rate above average in performance, attendance, and safety. Um, that because of their disability, um, they're, they're really committed and excited and, and often do a really good job. Their attendance is good. They do a good job with the performance and um, they have a lot of, they think through safety um, as they do particular tasks. And then again, disability, um, I think for everybody, and this is for the world, um, disability can happen to any, any one of us at any moment. And if we're not thinking about it, um, you know, it's, it's an important recognition and realization that we, any of us can step into the next moment could you could step into having a disability and then having to be able to navigate a world where oftentimes that isn't necessarily thought of as much as it should be um, as we try to think about making things accessible, accommodating folks when they need accommodations. You too may need an accommodation at some point. And so being mindful of that as you address your workplace and your work environment and those kinds of things and being open to the accommodation process um, is really, really helpful and important. What we often find um, in a surprising number of cases uh, is that we are finding employers making accommodations. Uh, and there's, there's reasons for that these days. Um, there's a lot of law and legalities with regard to making accommodations, obviously. Uh, but we often find, um, we find, we find the employers making accommodations simply because it's the right thing to do that there's a moral or ethical motivation or factor that supersedes all the other rationales for providing that particular accommodation. They're just trying to do the right thing for the folks that they have on staff. They value them. Um, and uh, when we work with folks, uh, we see that there is that tendency to be more open to, to think about what they're doing. Um, again, not as much from the legality side of things, but just really simply because it, it's a it's the right thing to do for someone. It's the moral or ethical thing to do to be able to help someone um, do those types of things. And when you think about accommodations, um, it just makes sense in a lot of ways. Uh, these are all reasons why uh, when you do an accommodation and it's a successful accommodation, um, it's important to recognize that there are some things that really are driving and motivating factors to doing that, um, to putting an accommodation in place for someone. Uh, increased productivity and independence, um, obviously allowing folks to be able to do their job faster, more productively, um, and allowing them to do it more independently as well. And so um, increased productivity and independence is a big one. Um, it allows employers to retain valuable employees 
making those accommodations will allow someone to stay at the job to continue doing what they're doing um, because they were doing a great job beforehand. Um, promotes communication and inclusion in the workplace. It just creates a more vibrant workplace when people feel cared for and understood and when accommodations are put in place uh, and it's more about the person and less about what it might cost to be able to put an accommodation in place. It obviously demonstrates good faith between the employer and the employee. And then there is the legality side of things too. The ADA states that employers must make accommodations um, for folks. Section 503, you know, the federal side of things. Um, there's legalities there too. Um, but again, I think jumping back to that previous slide, the moral or ethical things in our in our world, um, we see oftentimes kind of over and supersede some of those ADA and some of the legality part of it. But again, you've got all of these other things that really drive and are motivating factors um, to why we should do accommodations and should look at them um, more completely and um, be able to address those as they come up. I'm going to talk about a little bit about just the kind of accommodation framework and process. So we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, why to do accommodations, maybe even what some of them can kind of look like. But let's talk about the how and, and kind of the what, I guess. So as we talk about the accommodation process, probably the first thing to remember is that it's interactive. Uh, you know, if I think of an assistive technology evaluation, the word evaluation it can scare people or give them the wrong idea. Um, you know, if I think of an, most evaluations, it's it's answering questions, it's maybe filling out some forms. With assistive technology and accommodations, it's a little bit different. Yes, there is, of course, gathering of, of information, but it's also kind of a seeing what's not there or, or seeing what's missing uh, kind of thing, as well as just kind of the hands-on component of trying things out and getting information from the individual that way. So it all does start with gathering information. And that's just some different things related to the person, the task, and the equipment. And usually the person, of course, is the individual with the disability that needs the accommodation. The task is, where's that challenge? Where's the part that I'm not uh, able to do uh, because of my disability in order to really accomplish my goals? And that can be as simple and as simple as a, as a weighted word there, I suppose, but as simple as maybe one task that I'm having difficulty uh, completing to many, many, many tasks. Um, and then the equipment. Is there things that I need to access? Are there computers, assembly lines, the front door, all these different things and equipment that kind of come through that way? One thing, and, and where I see uh, AT specialists, accommodation specialists, and folks maybe get things wrong is kind of in this part. Uh, at least for my team, you know, they are some of the most amazing folks I've ever worked with very smart. They've worked with folks with probably almost every disability, most I can't even pronounce. But when they walk into an evaluation, they kind of, for lack of better terminology, throw all of that out the window because none of that really matters at the time. Because uh, as Brian said, you know, if you meet one person with one person with a disability, you've met one person with that disability. If you walk into the evaluation thinking, oh, this individual has insert disability here, and you're thinking about the things that might help them, sometimes you don't hear what the real need is uh, and how it might really affect the person uh, in a negative way or just not really meet the need or just be something that they hate using and eventually abandon and don't use anyway. So as you're gathering that information, I always say you can be the smartest person in the world, but when you walk in, you're completely ignorant of that person and their needs. So you got to kind of keep keep humble in order to really be able to do these kinds of things correctly. But the person, the task, and the environment, and while you're considering that, you also have to think about the environment around the individual. As I said, you know, with the, the kind of the movable stool, you do not want to put something permanent in place as other folks will just trip over it. Uh, if I have a visual impairment and I need my computer to say everything on the screen to me, well, if I'm in a cubicle environment, this could for provide some barriers to the folks around me. Uh, if I need to use voice input, 
and I'm sitting at a desk in a busy office where customers always are, dictating social security numbers into a database system probably isn't going to work very well in that environment. So you really have to take into a consideration all of those things around it too. Cost, as Brian said, it is always a consideration, but usually cost comes into consideration when you're between two things. If accommodation A will meet the need and the person likes it and they'll use it and accommodation B will do the same thing and they'll like it and it's usable and one costs less than the other, you go with the least cost option, of course. But if, uh, if darn it, the only thing that's going to work is this super expensive thing, then you kind of have to go with it because of those last two, which is effectiveness and personal considerations. And effectiveness can be in a few different ways. That can, of course, be uh, it meets this need absolutely perfectly. It's really great. It could also be, oh, this meets all five of these needs with one tool that they have to access, as opposed to having to access 25 different things to really meet these needs. And then kind of like I said, and you'll, you'll kind of see this go through, is those personal considerations. Um, especially, and we not only work with folks in, in the workplace and in job place accommodations, but also in, in college. Uh, so I only say that because when it comes to the personal considerations on that part, if I can implement something that looks like what everyone else in that class is using so that the individual with a disability isn't singled out, isn't using something kind of different than everyone else, they're much more likely to actually use it on the regular uh, as opposed to maybe something big that needs carried around or something that makes them stand out more than they might want to. Really taking into consideration those personal considerations, what's worked for them in the past, what do they like, and what are they actually going to use to get there? So really, in, and I kind of talked about this a little bit, it, it's problem solving. And you'll see that when we get into kind of the, I keep wanting to say experiments, but let's say ex exercises later. Uh, it, it's really problem solving. I, I'm standing on the edge of this large chasm and I need to get to the other side. There's tons of different ways over there. What's the best one and how do we do it? Looking at natural supports is, is kind of twofold. One, if, by the time, especially if they're, entering the world of work or they're on a job or something like that, I will guarantee you that the individual with a disability, no matter what it is, has accommodated themselves many times over the course of their life. So uh, it's always important to find out exactly what they've used in the past, how they've kind of accommodated those kind of things, and then just what's available there, what's available on the job site, what's already available through the company. We've went out and done multiple uh, job accommodations at times where let's say the person needs voice input and we recommend Dragon. And when we talk to IT about implementing it, they'll be like, oh yeah, we have that available to all employees. All they have to do is ask. No one ever told anyone that. So it's very important to know that those things are there and, and be able to get those. Implementing the solution is, is always very important. Make sure that everything works and works well in the environment. Uh, and with that, I will say that we're wrong sometimes. Uh, you might have what you think is absolutely perfect and you get out there and darn it, it's not. Uh, but that's all part of problem solving is, you know, you, you come up with the best option, you implement it, you look at those results and you go, you decide whether to go back to the drawing board or to, to go ahead and keep doing with what you're doing. And then training. Training is probably the most important and yet most overlooked uh, part of this entire process. If I need an accommodation at work and you put it on my computer or whatever it is I'm trying to access and don't teach me how to use it, I'm not going to use it. And I'm not going to use it for very long because now I'm trying to do a job that I need an accommodation for and figure out how the heck to use that accommodation Eventually, I'm just going to push off that accommodation and not do it. So it's very important that I know how to use it. And when I say know how to use it, uh, I don't need to know how to use it to do everything in the world or even everything that that accommodation can do. I need to know how to use it to overcome the barriers that I'm having at work and in the workplace and to be able to accommodate my job. Uh, and then if I want to learn all the other bells and whistles on my own, awesome. But as long as I can use it for the task that I'm trying to accommodate. Then, then training successful. And then kind of where do you start? Uh, how do you begin this whole thing? How do you uh, 
even begin, you know, the accommodation process and the evaluation, well, let's always start with familiar tools and strategies. What, what are they currently using? What's readily available around there? What What's working? Uh, so much of this time, it sounds like we just focus on what's not working. Well, what is working? Because occasionally, it's maybe not an actual piece of assistive technology, but a process that needs changed or, or something along those lines, which is kind of the next part. If it's not working, can we adjust it just to better meet the needs? Brian mentioned sticking some blocks of wood underneath the desk. I mean, that's almost more of an adjustment than an accommodation, I would say, but we won't get into the semantics of, of those kind of words. And then if you're considering new tools and strategies, very important, and Brian will talk about this a little bit more when he talks about communication, but set reasonable expectations. We will talk about accommodations all day. Uh, we'll talk about assistive technology and all the amazing things that it's able to do. It can't do everything. Uh, there's not a piece of assistive technology to accommodate every single need. Uh, there's there's times that it's not the, the kind of best thing, but really just set those reasonable expectations of what can be done, what can't be done, and maybe what the employer might need to do on their side in order to make these things work. And then Brian mentioned at the beginning about, uh, you know, across the life cycle, consider future supports as well. Uh, some disabilities are degenerative. So where I may need uh, voice input with a regular mouse today, I might need full switch access in a few years or voice input with a different access method because I'm some of those abilities that I have now may deteriorate or with vision or with hearing. A lot of times these can uh, be progressive with, in nature. So really thinking about that during the evaluation so that what you put in place can hopefully adjust and adapt with the individual, or, I mean, you can always come back and, and kind of redo, but if you can really get most of those accommodated the first time and accommodate those future needs as much as possible at the same time. So after the assessment, after the evaluation, meet with the individual, look at the space, try out some different things, find out all their needs and everything like that. At least in our program, and I, and I think most, it, it comes writing a report. And in the report is all of the information kind of gathered from testing equipment, from listening to the individual, from looking at the environment, looking at what all they need on the job and all those things. And, and this all goes in there. And this is really for a continued conversation with whomever has asked for the evaluation, be it the employer, workman's comp, insurance, uh, vocational rehabilitation, the VA, whomever it is that's, that's kind of got it. It also gives you time to research different recommendations and really kind of put a plan together for what's going to happen. In a good report, at least for my team, what I always tell them is, you know, if you're recommending a, a piece of equipment, a piece of assistive technology, a program, a support, whatever it is, it really just needs to go right back to the barrier, you know, the and come right back to uh, the individual is having problems on the job with this system because of this barrier, and here's how this piece of equipment meets that need, and why we're going with that one over something else. So really all that's there, but then also those training recommendations, which sometimes can change the cost of things. If, if an individual uh prefers one system and it's a little bit more expensive but they know how to use it well would training make the other ex system more expensive so even considering those even going on and getting quotes as a provider at least here in indiana if we recommend stuff we'll we cannot we don't purchase it uh it just kind of helps us stay uh unbiased and on our recommendations and make sure we're getting what's right for the person and then kind of what makes a good uh, recommendation, again, kind of just back to a full description of it. And then justification, how is it going to meet the need? Why is it important to be here? And then when the whole report's put together, it should really just be a complete roadmap to successful implementation. And I've read reports from other, other programs across the, the state, the nation, and they all are written completely differently in format, but they all do that last part correctly. And it's just... I mean, to break it down to the most simple, uh, individual has a problem with this part of the job due to this barrier. Here's what we'll put in place. Here's how it's going to work. And then what's nice is if you have it in that whole way, if it doesn't work, so, and again, uh, none of us are perfect, um, 
if it doesn't work, <clears throat> it's very easy to go back in, figure out why it didn't, and hopefully be able to put something else in place that can meet the individual's need. How about I unmute myself there? Um, I think ultimately communication, um, all of those things in that accommodation process, if it needs to start and it needs to end with communication. Um, it's ironic. We have so much technology at our disposal to be able to communicate, yet I think oftentimes and certainly sometimes communication is the most challenging part of the process. You know, everyone who is a stakeholder in the particular situation, you need to be able to oftentimes broaden your look a little bit. It's not just the employer or the employee. It might be the training manager. It might be the coworker who's next to that particular person. It might be a family member who's invested in the process as well. We all need to take time to be able to communicate clearly and honestly with each other um, to make sure we're setting expectations and we're, we're moving along that road together. Um, and what I think you'll find is if there is an open line of communication, if it's open, it's honest, it's clear, you're going to get best practices in the end. Um, when you get to the end of that accommodation, you will find it's going to be more successful um, and um, it's going to meet those needs uh, more readily. I think also uh, another question we get oftentimes is timing. Um, when people ask us a lot. VR counselors ask us a whole lot here in Indiana, when's the right time to make an accommodation? And so um, that is a really good question uh, when you think about it. Um, when we think about when is the right time, it really depends. Um, you wanna make sure it's early enough so that you have enough information to make good decisions. Um, and so when someone's looking at a particular job, Sometimes certain aspects of that job may or may not be able to be accommodated for a particular person's needs. Well, you want to have an eval done early enough so that you don't go ahead and accept that job and then realize that you really can't do that job. And so um, obviously early enough so that you have enough information to make good decisions, but you don't want to do it too early as well um, because assessments can be costly. And if you're going from job to job to job and looking at those jobs individually, you don't want to do too many of them because it's going to get pretty costly pretty quickly. And then again, not too late, um, because if you do it too late, um, there's no time. Um, then it gets into some of, th some of the things that Josh mentioned earlier. When you're trying to learn how to do a job and the tools that you need to do that job at the same time, it can be very overwhelming for folks. And so you don't want to also do it too late when a person's job's in jeopardy or they're really trying to learn the job and get comfortable at the job and they've got to now learn all of this assistive technology down the road as well. And so what we oftentimes tell folks is when technology is one of the remaining issues and or the key to opening a door or a path for a particular person in their job, that's when you should move forward with the evaluation. And so when there is a specific issue that comes up or um, you're really trying to open up an opportunity for somebody, that's when you do those. And so um, when is the right time is oftentimes uh, a question we get from a lot of folks. And a lot of times it's different. It depends on the situation. It depends on the individual. It depends on the job. It depends on the type of technology that might be needed. Um, it can look different for each and every person. And so again, going back to that, sh that slide with the shoes, everybody's a little bit different, every situation is a little bit different, um, and then having an open line of communication to whoever you're working with as that assistive technology specialist is really important to make sure that the timing is right for things, that you're not spending a whole lot of money on things that um, you're not going to need um, and or you're getting to situations quickly enough so that folks have enough information to make good decisions and are able to do the job and not be stressed or anxious or those types of things. I want to talk through a couple of hiccups and glitches. Um, I've got five common hiccups and glitches that we'll talk about. Hiccups and glitches, I mean, obviously we, we live in an imperfect world. Not everything just goes so smoothly. Um, I think we all probably uh, experience that day in and day out. And so these are things that we oftentimes run across when we um, have, uh, when we're working on an accommodations. Um, and so I'll just kind of run down through these a little bit with you. Um, so the first is managing expectations, keeping everyone on the same page throughout that process. You know, everybody has a different expectation. It's important to keep everybody together. 
um, whether you're the employee or the employer, you're a coworker, you're the training manager, all of those different folks, um, it's important to make sure that people are understanding where things are at any given point along that accommodation process. And so um, managing expectations can be a real challenge for folks as you work on accommodations for, for someone. Um, there's also the waiting game, that hurry up and slow down. There's a lot of time, a lot of moving parts um, to implementing an accommodation. Whether you're waiting on funding, um, you know, it takes a little while. There's, there's some hurdles that need to be overcome. It just doesn't happen overnight. You, you know, our VR system here in Indiana just doesn't hop on Amazon and order equipment and it shows up the next day. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for that equipment to show up. Um, you also have an IT department who a lot of times things are interfacing with the company's IT infrastructure and you've got to work through some hurdles to make sure that a particular piece of software can run on the network and be able to provide access for someone who you're accommodating. And so you're really trying to match everyone's speed along the way. Um, and the more people that are involved in the situation, the more stakeholders that are involved, the harder this can become. There's also the what's changed. Um, sometimes things can take a long time. Um, obviously it's that hurry up, it's the slow down. It can take a long time to finish an accommodation for somebody. Um, and whether that's the person or the job that's changed from the beginning, the evaluation phase to the implementation phase, a lot of th things can change um, from one day to the next. You know, Josh mentioned earlier, disability is often degenerative in nature and the person's needs might have changed from when we did the eval at the beginning. You may also find the job has changed. Maybe there was a particular task that we didn't think of or wasn't talked about during the assessment. And now that we're implementing solutions for these other things, the other things that this person's doing, uh, we need to now address something new that wasn't expected. And then we have those same hurdles that we have to get and, and overcome um, that we talked about before. And so the things, things change and you gotta be um, responsive enough and nimble enough to be able to adapt as things go on with that accommodation process. The other one is the do I know you, um, who is who, um, realizing the fact that players oftentimes change throughout the process. Uh, so whether that's the VR counselor, the employer, the hiring manager, the training manager, maybe it's coworkers, et cetera. It's important to recognize that the client is the only constant in the equation. Um, and so making sure um, that when things happen or when players change, um, you're able to bring the new person, the new stakeholder up to speed about where we are and what's going on and how we are proceeding to be able to accomplish a particular accommodation. And I'll be the first to say that's not always easy. That's, I'm sorry, that's not always easy. New stakeholders don't always see things the way other people saw them. So if you had the hiring manager and now a new manager is in place, making them or helping them understand where things are, they may just have a different opinion about the particular person or the particular job. Um, and you've got to be able to be nimble again enough to be able to address some of those issues with them to make sure that you can successfully accommodate that particular individual. And this is my favorite picture in the whole slide deck because um, sometimes I just feel like the squirrel, right? You know, if it's not one thing, it's another. Oftentimes secondary, secondary or totally unrelated um, issues cause is could cause a problem. Um, you know, even though they're secondary or they're unrelated, they still um, are issues. And so that could be transportation, making sure that the person can take a bus from one place to the next. Um, and or maybe it's their supporting tech stops working. Example for like wheelchairs and other types of things. And so um, you have to be able to also address those things. And so to kind of cast your net a little bit wider, think through things that are outside of the specific job that may play a supporting role and may cause issues um, so that you have a plan to be able to address the issues. Having a couple of different options for transportation. Wheelchairs are one of those things where it can take weeks or months to be able to get a replacement part. What happens when their wheelchair is down and they can't use that wheelchair um, to travel in to work? Um, is there an option to be able to work from home and having different solutions ready and available for folks should something in that supporting or secondary role cause issues on that job? And so um, common hiccups and glitches.
And Brian, I think uh, just real quick, kind of adding to that, if you notice a lot of those, I mean, except for, of course, uh, you know, the unrelated things kind of kind of breaking down, it all goes back to that communication that Brian mentioned earlier that can overcome most of those hiccups and glitches. I mean, now, granted, when you have a manager who's very all about the accommodations and they get fired and they hire someone who doesn't really care about those kind of things. Yeah, communication only gets you so far. But uh, as you can really see, just keeping everybody on the same page throughout the entire process does overcome a decent amount of those uh, up front. Excellent. Uh, we're going to go on to our next slide here. Um, and this is this is the part of hopefully everybody's still interested, paying attention, and ready to be able to be interactive with us a little bit. Um, this is kind of our the, play, the place holder for when we would break out into groups in person. Well, we're all online, and so we're going to do this a little bit differently. And so I'll explain this a little bit differently. Um, so we have some different solutions, and we'll walk through those one at a time with you. Um, we've got an individual I'm, with a particular... Yep. This is Laura. I do see um, Sarah Jensema has her hand up. Sarah, okay. did you want to put something in chat or do you want to uh, want me to unmute you so you can talk? You should be able to share now if you are looking to, Sarah. And maybe that was an accidental hand raise. So if you have a question, Sarah, please feel free to put it in chat. Thanks. Go ahead, Brent, sorry. No problem. Um, hopefully you guys can still hear me. Josh, can you give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? I'm switching my headset, so I was getting a little bit of feedback there. Um, so again, this is where we're gonna talk about on-the-fly accommodations. Um, it's kind of an interactive brainstorming session. We've got an individual with a disability, they're at a particular job or work site, and they have particular tasks that they're having issues with. And what we want to do is use the chat today to talk about different solutions that might be able to address the issues that these folks are having at their work site. And so, um, the, however, before we jump into that, there's a couple of rules. And this is where this creativity comes into play. Um, and so on our next slide, I've got rules of engagement today. Um, we're going to take about five or 10 minutes on a slide, probably closer to five or uh, maybe 10 minutes because it's going to take folks to, a little bit of time to put it into the chat room. Here's some of our rules. We have to spend less than $100. And we can only use items that are typically sold in that particular location. So within that particular environment, that store, um, you can only use items that are found there. Um, so keep that in mind. Spend less than $100 and only use items that are, are typically sold in that particular location. Um, and here's, here's the deal. I purposely have left out some details so that you guys can fill in some of the blanks about a particular person's abilities um, based on what their disability is and or the type of store. Um, that they're in and what that store might have available for folks. And so, um, again, $100 or less using items that are typically sold in a particular location. And so the first one um, is a deli, and we're going to take some time. Um, and so get your hands on those keyboards and get ready to type into the chat. Um, here's, the, here's the scenario. Um, the location is a grocery store. Um, the, do the job is working at, in the deli area, um, so they are the person who stands behind the deli counter. They will slice the meat, they get the cheese, they also scoop the salads, potato salad, all the other stuff that's behind there, and they give those to the customers over top of the counter when they order them. Um, the disability we're talking about today um, is dwarfism and limited hand strength. Uh, and again, you can make some assumptions about what that person's abilities are with those particular things in mind. Uh, and then here's the problems that they have. Um, there is a big slicer. And one of the things this person has to do is get the meat from the cooler or the freezer and transport it over to the slicer. Um, and sometimes, I don't know if you've seen some of the size of those, those packaged meats, those are very large. Um, and really heavy. 
Um, so when you think about limited hand strength and being able to cart that from the freezer to the slicer to be able to cut the meat up, um, that can be a real challenge for them. Um, also, potato salad um, is located at the front of the display um, and sometimes dipping things from big containers or reaching things that are at the front of the display are really challenging um, because of dwarfism and not having that reach um, that would be required to be able to get those things from the front of that deli counter. And so with that, um, I am expanding my chat on my window um, and I'm looking for responses. As you think about those things, those problems, what type of accommodations do you think could be helpful for someone in this situation? And Brian, would you like to remind them once again about the rules as far as I remember participating in this. This is Laura, and it was um, the biggest challenge for us trying to come up with solutions was the fact it had to be something that was within that store. Yeah. Luckily, my scenario was a very creative store, so I think our group <laughs> had a little more leeway. So right. just a reminder to everyone that it has to be something from within that business. Yeah, something, something from within the store in $100 or less. And I start to see a lot of things popping into the chat. Um, someone mentioned rearranging the display to make it more accessible. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Moving things around, um, reorganizing some things that do require or, or maybe even used more often to the back of the display where you're going to be using those more often can be really, really helpful. Um, someone mentioned a stepping stool. Uh, and, and that's absolutely, I would maybe even recommend a stepping stool, not only out at behind the deli counter, um, but also maybe in the freezer, you know, so mm -hmm. that they can have two. Uh, here's something to think about with that one. Um, think about something that's on wheels, easily movable, transportable, lightweight, or something like that, so that if you're not using that as an, another coworker or whatnot, it's easy to move out of the way and to be able to store away when it's, when it's in the way for those folks. Um, someone mentioned moving the potato salad back. Yep, reorganizing, rearranging things for things that are used more often. Someone mentioned small rolling cart. Absolutely, mm -hmm. that's super important. Um, being able to kind of maybe take the meat off the shelf in the freezer, put it on a cart, wheel it over to the slicer, helps you be able to get it closer and lift it up onto the, uh, the slicer. Also see longer handled, longer handed spoons and long tongs to be able to reach that stuff in the front and be able to get it up. So that's always a good one in case it can't be moved to the back or moved in another place. Yep. And I'll mention with those longer handles, like those, it might not take a whole lot to be able to, if you don't have one in the store, if you don't have one readily available for yourself, it doesn't take a whole lot to make one. Um, Sometimes I love being Tim, the tool man, Taylor, and kind of making things and, and designing some things for folks. And so um, it wouldn't take a whole lot with some of the things that you might find in a grocery store to make something a little bit bigger in those ways. Modifying the handle for the for the slicer, definitely a great way. I'm sure there's something in that grocery store you can use from, you know, uh, we've used things from duct tape to make things bigger, easily, more easily graspable. I'm probably saying that wrong, but um, but easier to kind of grasp and be able to use in different kinds of ways. Um, I know there's one. Darn it. I just saw one. I'm reading them too fast. Here's one. Uh, here's one that I think is side squeeze portion scoop. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. I think this is what you're talking about when you said that, but I always think of those ice cream scoops with the lever on the side that help you empty the scoop. Um, and so sometimes getting what a potato salad is going to stick to your scoop, right? And so to get that stuff off there, having some sort of thing to be able to help, but like the lever thing to be able to empty that scoop might be helpful. Absolutely. And another one, I think it's on that same one is the bag opener. Sometimes that can be just a huge thing. A lot of times, you know, you're using a, a box cutter or maybe some other kind of device and that might not be able to be gripped in a meaningful and safe manner. So, so yeah, there's all kinds of different stuff that may very well, again, you can get a little creative with what the grocery store has. Um, but a lot of grocery stores are connected to a place that sells consumer goods. So it could easily just have a different kind of bag opener in order to be able to either open up the bags of meat or be able to open up the small bags that you put the meat in after they are cut. Love it. Um, someone mentioned cutting out a section of a, of a kind of a 
pail um, so that you can hold the uh, potato salad stationary um, while you're scooping it. So something to be able to kind of keep things in place while you're trying to scooping so the, the thing's not moving all around. Um, that would be definitely an issue. Some of those times they're just in a bowl um, and there's ice around it. And so it's going to move as you try to scoop stuff. And so having something that can kind of hold those in place would be super helpful um, and important to think about as well. Yep. Uh, and a few folks, and, and this kind of, you know, keeps coming up, could the slicer be moved to a lower level? Probably. Uh, and that's just a, just another thing, as long as other folks can kind of use it. But yeah, and I think that shows the importance that sometimes just modifying the environment is the accommodation in and of itself. That a lot of times doesn't cost anything. And as long as it doesn't cause a barrier to access to other individuals, always a great, great, great way to go. Here's one too, uh, and I love that this is in here because one of the things that we oftentimes look at are just natural supports in the environment. Someone mentioned, is there a coworker that can help with lifting heavier items? A absolutely, we're always looking for ways to be able to kind of, again, if you think about implementing simple solutions, it doesn't always have to be, you know, uh, if, if there's another coworker, maybe there's a way to be able to job carve or, or um, provide assistance and help with certain tasks. And so that's a that's a great thing to think about and, and have. Um, and then I see placing placing lightweight items on higher shelves and heavier items on lower shelves. I wish every place just did that anyway. Um, because I think that's <laughs> just a, a, a good kind of way to go. But yes, you're right. Just some and and sometimes it's making sure that the processes that you already have in place are done correctly in order to make it accessible for not just your employees with disabilities, but everybody on the team. Uh, and and kind of going along with what what Brian said about, you know, having somebody help with the heavier stuff, you should probably do that with everybody just to be on the safe side for some yeah. things. So another one in here that I think is really helpful just to say too is um possibly pre-cutting the meat and some other products into smaller chunks before you store them. Um, so that it's easier to carry and transport. Sometimes instead of the 20 pound or 25 pound piece, you know, hunk of meat up there, well, maybe you cut it in half and make it less or maybe thirds and make it even let, more or less. So um, great, great solutions um, for this particular session. Thank you guys. Um, you guys are very creative um, and I love this. This is great. We were very worried that no one would put anything in chat and just be Brian and I <laughs> blathering back to each other. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Next one, um, convenience store. Here's one for you. So the location is a convenience store um, and the job is stocking shelves and placing security tags on different items. Um, so the person's disability is they have autism and they have other cognitive issues. Uh, again, I'll let you make some assumptions as far as the level of cogn cognition and other kinds of things that that person may encounter mm -hmm. based on their disability. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that they have is they need to be able to identify which items to tag um, for those security tags, because anything over $10 in the store needs to have a security tag on it. And then the second thing is, where do items go on those particular shelves? And so... Um, think about that again. It's a, you have to spend less than $100 and use items within the convenience store. How would you go about helping them understand which items are above $10, which ones items are lower than $10, and where would you go, and how do you help them understand where to put things throughout the store as they stock shelves? I'll give you a moment to think about this and to write your answers. And so someone mentioned different colored tags mm -hmm. based on price. Absolutely. Um, I would advocate for clear, large, color-coded labels. Um, you, can, you can go to an office supply store and find the little circular dots that are colored pretty simply and easily. Um, and you can stick those on different things based on their price. Or for this scenario, they just sell those at the convenience store, but that's okay. We can find yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very yeah. convenient, convenient <laughs> store. <laughs> absolutely. <clears throat> Uh, laminated photo examples of correct shelf stocking. As someone that came from employment, I can tell you that laminated pictures of what's supposed to be done may be the best accommodation in the world. 
uh, for individuals, but most definitely. Uh, you figure even a convenience store, I probably have a printer and a computer where I can make that up, um, snap a picture and kind of keep it. Or, I mean, even if the individual has their own device, a, a lot of individuals may have an iPad, an iPhone, uh, an Android tablet or something like that where they could hold it up and have a picture of it to know where everything goes. So great, great way. Uh, yeah, map of the whole area as well on rings so they can easily go back and forth. Great, great accommodation. Um, someone mentioned an area for dollar items. So maybe you have a particular area in the store for $5 items or $10 items. And I think that's a great way to do that as well. You know, organize shelves in the store or products in the store with pricing in mind. Um, so even if, even if they have different pricing, as long as on the shelf, the pricing is based on where that is located on that shelf. Um, and you could do that as well, for sure. I think also pictures for items. Someone said photos or a spreadsheet of the store and a book that a person um, would know where items go. Um, absolutely, especially for cognitive issues, being able to have you know, a picture of the item. I don't know, like there are probably a hundred different types of potato chips. Some of them look similar, especially if it's Fritos and you got the barbecue Fritos, you got the chili Fritos and you got the regular Fritos. They're all in similarly packaged bags. Um, so someone with a cognitive need might need to be able to distinguish which one's which, um, especially if they've got different pricing and, and where to put those. And so um, you can certainly do that as well. I don't see this listed. You know, another thing that I, I have heard folks say as we've done this before is, is create a routine for somebody, make sure it's a consistent routine so that people start and move shelf by shelf, shelf product by product. If you can create a consistent routine with somebody, um, sometimes that can help with organization and helping them kind of move through things in a more organized fashion and they'd be able to learn that repetition. It's kind of like muscle memory. You do it over and you do it over and you do it over again. And sometimes being able to remember and understand and work through uh, what you have to do makes it a lot easier for folks. Looks good. Excellent job on that one too. I got, I got another one for it. We've got six of these scenarios. And so um, we'll get our next one here um, for the sake of time. So here's one for you, um, hobby store, uh, hobby store. The job is someone works behind the framing booth. Um, the person's disability is they are colorblind and they are deaf. And so the issue is they can't, they have a really hard time matching the frame to the mat color. Um, so if you get frames, you get that little pretty little colored mat in between. So they're having a difficult time because of their colorblindness matching the frame to the matte color. Um, and they're also finding interpersonal communication with customers difficult and or um, hearing overhead pages are also difficult. So if someone's calling them from the front of the store and they need something from them, how do they communicate in that way as well? And so again, it's $100 or less and it's something from within this particular hobby, hobby superstore, craft store, those types of things. So I saw the first one that, that kind of popped up there was a color identifying app on the phone. Definitely helpful if they're using kind of the main colors, but when it gets down to white versus eggshell versus off-white versus, you know, all those different colors, it can be a little, little challenging, uh, but definitely a way to get, uh, you know, what's red, what's green, what's black, blue, brown, and get all that kind of information kind of in there. Um and then the paint samples and labeled colors uh, and labeling the frame so that they can easily kind of look that, oh, this is blue number four or this is white number six and easily match those is a, is kind of a great way. Brian, so I'm not just talking all the time. I'll let you take some. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, someone mentioned if they have a phone or a tablet, talk to text um, for that interpersonal communication. Uh, that certainly is something that we've used as accommodations for some folks that we work with. Certainly in the store, as you're trying to communicate from employee to employee, if someone's at the front of the store, text the person who's deaf back at the back at the framing station. Um, a lot of times that's a common way to do that. It's free, it's typically on your phones. Um, if your employer allows you to have your phone on you, that's a great way to help with interpersonal communication. Um, I think someone mentioned color-coded labels or tags for frames and mats. 
making it easier to match the colors that go well with each other. Um, you may also, I think someone mentioned it as well, even some sample displays, you know, maybe if there's a frame and matte combinations, you know, so there's a visual reference for not only the person who's framing, um, but also for the customer to help make choices and guide customers as they make those choices. Yeah, and I love the way that that you you guys all came up with totally different ways to identify what the things were. So you know, uh, labels, uh, using bump dots, using different. Um, I forgot the darn word. Where is it? Patterns. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Using different patterns, using different uh, kind of ways to make it to where you're not identifying uh, by color, but instead by some other uh, kind of way is is really great. Yeah. A um, couple things I want to throw in here, just free apps. So since folks are having phones, um, we have a really great relationship with Intrac. It's our Indiana Telephone Relay Association. Um, they are always using a couple of apps when we're having communication back and forth with them. Um, when we're in meetings together, Big Note is a great app. Buzzcard is made by Sorensen. It's a great app. Um, allows you to be able to type responses back and forth to each other or use your voice to text um, option on the, but it makes it very large. It's easy to read. It's easy to be able to hand something across and have someone read it back um, and for them to be able to reply to you. Um, those are a couple of, of free apps. And then I see, you know, if the, if the person's capital D deaf and uses ASL, even a little placard or kind of sign with a few words like uh, help, thank you, and maybe just a few little signs in order to, to kind of help the individual would be something that's very, very helpful. The blinking light when the pager is going off is is always a, a great one and something that it's a hobby store. We can play as much as we want with what may be available there, but those used to be horribly expensive. You had to rewire an entire building. They're not now. Uh, there's there's very simple things you can kind of do that. In fact, you can get sound detection on your iPhone nowadays to kind of pick up certain sounds and even train those. So a uh, great way. And in fact, there it is, decibel meter app. So maybe uh, the phone's flashing when there hears a loud sound like an announcement's happening. So yeah, lots of lots of great ideas. Love it. All right, next one, Garden Center. Um, so the garden center, you're working at a hardware store that has a garden center. So think of like a Lowe's or a Home Depot, I'm trying to think of the regional or national types of hardware stores that are out there. Um, the particular job is a garden center worker. Um, and the particular person's disability um, is they have age related low vision. Um, and they also have a lifting restriction. We'll say it's a 10 to 15 pound lifting restriction. Um, and so the problem that they have um, is they can't read plant labels or product tags. So they're having a real difficult time when a customer comes up and they're pulling the tag out, like, and they're looking for something that needs full sun, um, being able to read those on the labels, to be able to help direct and lead someone around um, their particular area. Um, the other one is they have difficulty moving plants. They have, some of those things can, can weigh quite a bit um, and they're in buckets and they have a difficult time moving things from one place to the other. Maybe it's from where it is, where it's being stored to the cash register. Um, so again, it's $100 or less and it has to be something that's within the store itself. So I see everybody already jumped on using seeing AI and Google Lens. That's definitely so it can so that it can easily read uh, the information on there. I would say a few years ago, depending on how pretty the information was, if it wasn't perfect perfect text, they would have a hard time reading it. But these days, yeah, you're right; it can read darn near anything. And then, of course, we are at a hardware store, so yes, hand trucks, dollies, all those things not only should be available to employees. If not, there should be a shelf somewhere where you can just go and grab one and pull it off and be able to to use it. Um, coworker support is always a big thing. And I think a lot of employers, just because of injuries and other things on the job, preach this stuff anyway. If it's too heavy for you to lift, get someone to help you. Definitely get somebody to come over and and do it. And then Rhonda, I just see that you kind of just put in there the photo chart with the with the plants that can be blown up because that could be made for any employee and made different sizes and even to help train new employees. Um, something I've seen in there before, Brian mentioned up, you know, mix the sun, the shade, hopefully in the store, those are already separated. So really just maybe marking those areas so the individual can easily quickly go to them is another way to kind of go along that same that same line. A couple other things I've seen folks mention with this particular accommodation. I chose the picture 
um, that you see on the screen for very specific reason. If you'll notice all the plants are on the ground um, at a lot of hardware stores, if I go to my Lowe's, they're up and off the ground. And so they've got cinder blocks underneath pallets. Um, so things are already off the ground. And sometimes that can make just moving something from, you know, the moving it from the ground up onto a cart can be pretty challenging. But if you're moving it up from a, from a stand down to the cart, it makes it a lot easier. And so um, lift the plants up off the ground if you can, if that's something that your employer or the place will allow. Um, so that you're not moving things down you're moving you're not moving things up but you're moving them down can make sometimes lifting or moving things a little bit easier um, i also have heard um, folks also mention limit that person's area uh, so that they can know the types of plants that are in their particular area so they can understand those they can learn all those things about each particular type of plant um, and therefore have the information already pretty well um, understood from their perspective um, so that as they work with folks, they can kind of lead them and direct them based on what they're asking for or needing. And, and I do like the the using the, the seeing AI and the Google Lens, just because if you've ever been to a home improvement store, even though this individual works in the garden center, guaranteed someone's going to ask them about toilets or something else. So uh, being able to use an app that you can bring up and actually maybe be able to read the signage and things like that can still assist customers not in his area or not in their area, uh, but still be able to use those same tools. Love it. All right, here's our next scenario. Um, next one is a pharmacy. Um, so think about local drugstore. Here in Indiana, we have CVS and Walgreens. Those are the main two. Um, and the job in this particular store is the person is a pharmacy tech. So they work behind the pharmacy counter. They're getting people their medications. They're assisting the actual pharmacist um, in making sure things are available. They're operating the cash register, doing those kinds of things. The disability, they are an upper amputee. Um, and again, I'm going to leave that a little bit up to you um, as far as what their abilities are. If they're a double amputee, um, if they still have one arm, those kinds of things, one hand, uh, you, I'll give you a little bit of flexibility and leeway with that. Um, but the problem, here's the problem. Um, they are having difficulty taking on and putting on caps or taking off and putting on caps. Um, so the pill bottles, um, doing those types of things, that's hard um, because of their upper amputee. Um, and they also have a difficult time operating the cash register cash register. So getting change and getting dollar bills in and out of that cash register is a challenge for them. And so with that being said, again, it's $100 or less. It's got to be something at the store. Um, and I'm going to let you guys go for it. Huh. Yeah. That's really, that's very true, Laura. Good thing CVS and Walgreens sell just about everything, right? Think about that a little bit. What are some things that folks might be able to use that are actually sold um, at a pharmacy uh, for this particular situation? Yep, sticky mm -hmm. page turners for reading and turning pages, absolutely. Might be able to help with some of the dollar bills as well. Sure. Others. Yep, I bet they sell jar and bottle openers. Absolutely. Maybe it's a grabber um, or something to assist with twisting mm -hmm. those, those, those caps on and off. Absolutely. Easy to open caps. Yes, um, yeah. those, are, those are sold. <laughs> you know, think about all the things at a, at a, at a um, pharmacy or a drugstore that uh, folks design and are used by people who have arthritis. You know, I think about mm -hmm. that and, and what are they using to be able to open those things. A lot of times it's something sticky to be able to grab onto the cap to help you turn. Um, yeah, absolutely. Have a credit card only line during peak hours. It's a, a great idea. I mean, a lot of folks are, uh, especially at the pharmacy, probably using maybe a health saver benefit card or something like that. So yeah, just have one that's credit only, no cash. Uh, you wouldn't even have to have another cash red or an actual cash register there. So great idea. Yep. I love the one, the, um, where was it? Do, do, do. 
Where was that? Oh, the jar opener. So they got those jar openers with the hand with with a handle, um, but they come up and they kind of make a V shape with a little bit of some. There's like little things in there that you can kind of grab onto something with. Turn that upside down. Put that on the counter. You can slide that pill bottle up and into it. It'll grab onto that cap, and then you can have it. You can help it turn that way as well. You can also have that mounted to the the bottom of an overhead shelf, so you can slide it in and and that way the pills wouldn't fall out of the bottle. Absolutely. We also see job carving in there, so just kind of take some of those tasks and maybe split them up amongst some folks so that you're only doing uh, kind of one thing at a time, but maybe you fill the bottles, get all the medication together, and the person next to you does the screwing on as you kind of do assembly line style. So that's always a way to get around it too. Yep, credit card only. You mentioned, I think, that one, credit card only lines. Um, I've seen at, at different types of stores, these drawers that pull fully out, um, that they're not tucked into the machine. And so being able to pull something fully out gives people a little bit easier um, a way to be able to grab onto things, um, to grasp something. And so you might also think about those thimble finger grips um, for removing and sorting money and those types of things that might help with the cash register as well. Absolutely. I think my favorite one I've ever seen anyone use on this is uh, a kid's bank money counter attached to it so that it just spits the change out kind of style. But they're like, well, maybe they sell that in the toy section. Well, maybe <laughs> they do. That might work. Um, but yeah, just something that kind of counts out change uh, that way. So it's a little bit easier to kind of access. Um, and yeah, you're right. There are registers that do provide the change. And I think a lot of them do. Uh, in fact, I, I still know that if I, which is rare, ever pay cash, I see the look of horror in the person's face across the, the register these days, it seems like, because no one no one uses cash. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I, I, I think, and I, I really like, and I don't even know if we've seen on here before, Brian, actually changing and actually just making a credit only kind of line that the individual like that. can assist with. I really, I really do. do, really do like that because A, you're not probably getting rid of a whole lot of customers doing that uh, and being able to accommodate the need very, very easily for no cost whatsoever. Love it. All right, guys, one more, uh, one more um, scenario. Um, so this one, you are in an office superstore. Um, so the job we're trying to accommodate is for someone who works in the copy center. And you can kind of see an example of what a typical copy center might look like. It's think about a Xerox or uh, maybe it's in a Staples or some sort of an office supply store. And they've got all those different types of scanners and copiers and other types of equipment to be able to put materials together for folks. The person's disability is a traumatic brain injury. Um, and the problem they're having is they're trying to remember people's orders. So customer orders as they come in, what's needed, how, ma how many copies are needed, how many things, like what, what is that particular order and what do they need to do? Um, and then obviously a lot of that machinery is pretty complex. Um, and so how do they operate those when they have to move from one machine to the next machine? Is there, is there a way for him or for them to clearly understand how to use those those machines as they move from one thing to the next and to keep customer orders um, straight. So just to, to start kind of going through them as you were talking, because they were they were coming up quick. So I see a couple of folks kind of jumped on the the super, you know, great thing about being in this kind of shop. Print out a checklist, print out step by step directions, laminate them, put them right there so that everyone knows how to use it. And that is not just for the individual with a disability, but every new employee benefits from having that right there. Not even a new employee. If, if you know, if somebody's covering in there, having that kind of information can just make it so much more usable. A tape recorder as a memory aid is a great thing, too, to be able to kind of be able to keep on task or maybe know what the next step is for those kind of things. Um, so I'm very interested in goblin tools, <laughs> what those are. That's I'm interested in knowing more about that, but I'll have to look that one up a little bit later. <laughs> Voice memos, uh, all kinds of, of different things like that. QR codes, which is a great way to, to kind of put a lot of information in there, something very easy. So order forms with carbon copies. Yeah, you can still do the old carbon copy piece and be able to carry that around with you so you know um, what orders you're working on and, and be able to take that with you as they come in. Dry erase board, something 
that's up on a wall maybe that you can kind of list the customer orders and what's needed. That would be a good solution as well. Oh, Goblin Tools, here it is, has something that breaks down task lists to make more manageable and less overwhelming detailed lists. I love that. I'll have to well, play check, that. check mark. I try to learn something new every day and that's done. So um, I will definitely go back and use that. But yeah, you, you, everybody kind of hit the, the same thing, just some, some different things to be able to kind of remind or, or keep those tasks separated or really just have something that I can look at. For some individuals we, we work with, just they may never use that tool, but just knowing it's there brings down the anxiety and the worry of, oh gosh, I haven't used this machine. What am I possibly going to do? Just knowing that tool's there to be able to go through can be a, a, a huge change. And then another thing with the kind of remembering orders is for some businesses is maybe look at our process. Are we printing out something that's horribly complex and hard for anyone to read? Could we make that what prints out of an order a whole lot easier for everyone to understand in the way that we're kind of accommodating this individual. So there's always those kind of things as well. I will say as somebody that works in accommodations, I don't lead with that with employers. That's not usually a good way to, to kind of go. But if I'm looking at it going, listen, I can't understand what the heck you're trying to say, then it's it, it maybe it's time to look at some of those processes. But awesome, awesome, awesome. You guys did great, and we were very scared how that was going to work online, because uh, as as Brian and Laura kind of said, usually people would break into groups in person uh, and and each take one and then kind of come back and discuss. But thank you all so much for for being so active there kind of in the chat. Yeah, um, I'm very impressed with how quickly people are able to type and get their thoughts out um, so quickly. You guys are amazing. <laughs> that was really, really cool. Um, so here, let me I'm going to move on to the next slide for you, Josh. Okay. So as you kind of saw by all of these different scenarios and the different uh, kind of ways, there's so many tasks that come into a job uh, and that may or may not require accommodation. As we talked about those things, we talked about some barriers the individual had on the job. But if you think there was a lot of tasks they also did on that job that didn't need any kind of accommodation. Um, as you can tell, there was different accommodations to do the exact same thing. Uh, and there's there's always kind of the availability to choose between them. And there's a lot of things that you have to think about when making those recommendations on what might be best. And really, that's where the, the whole job accommodation of value or of job, too big of a word, job accommodation evaluation comes into place to figure out what's the best, what can be implemented. And sometimes that is assistive technology. And especially, you know, I don't know who the whole audience is, but we love talking about assistive technology. I do a weekly podcast as well as like another podcast just talking about it. I, my wife hates hearing about it, even though she thinks it's cool, but you just talk about it too much. But sometimes it's just consumer goods. Uh, and, and kind of an exercise with this uh, same thing is that Brian and I both have a bad habit of going to those home improvement stores. And we might be looking for something for the house, but we're also like, hmm, how can I modify that to help somebody with this need? Or how can I take what's already available and just use it in a different kind of way? Sometimes it's something that's familiar and available. Sometimes I have walked into accommodation, so is my team, and the person's having a giant difficulty with something on the job. And in talking to them, you realize that they've had an issue very close to this before. They've used something that they've already got. And next thing you know, boom, you're right there. But when done correctly, it is always a very, very good, good thing. Um, yeah, and I do work all the time. That's true. And we'll put that in there. I saw Laura put that down in the <laughs> chat. But uh, so, Brian, you were going to leave them with some resources and different things that can assist them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I don't want to, I always want to leave folks with some resources. And maybe these are things that you're already aware of. Um, you're obviously um, working with WizTech um, up, in, up in Wisconsin. Um, I just want to draw some attention to, uh, first and foremost, state AT programs. Um, so, uh, much like in data here in Indiana, WizTech up in, in Wisconsin, um, every state, every territory has a, a state assistive technology act program. Um, our purpose in existence, um, according to the law um, that we operate under, is twofold. Um, ultimately, it kind of boils down for me is that we are there to spread the word um, to help people get their hands on assistive technology. Um, and so we do a lot of different things to make sure people are aware of the different types of tools and assistive technology or the resources that are available from state to state 
Um, in this particular case, you're looking for um, people to help make accommodations for employees in your state. Um, they should know who the AT players are, who can provide accommodations, who can provide evaluations, um, maybe able to direct you to those folks. Um, but they also do some other things that can really help the evaluator and the person as they're getting into work, as they're doing their job um, by getting people's hands on it. A couple of the ways that folks that we as state AT programs work to be able to get devices and technology in people's hands um, as we offer device demonstrations. Um, so here in Indiana, and I'm assuming it's like this elsewhere um, as well, um, we will go to your door anywhere in the state of Indiana to be able to show you the bells and whistles on any type of technology that you have an interest in, as long as it's a part of our loan library. Um, and so we have a vast assistive techno technology loan library here. Um, and so you, you could ask for a device demo in your state and have someone come and show you some bells and whistles so that you can evaluate whether a particular product or a particular item is going to meet the needs of the person that you're working with. Or that particular person can do the same thing. It doesn't matter who they are. Um, they can ask for a device demonstration. Um, the thing that I tease out in this, it's not typically an evaluation, it's just a demonstration. You were just showing some bells and whistles and help, helping people make informed decisions on the devices that might help them day to day. The device loan library, I think this is where the rubber hits the road for a lot of folks. Um, the device loan library, um, which a lot every state um, assistive technology act program operates to some degree or another um, is a great way for you to actually try something out for a short term period um, here in indiana we do 30-day loans you're going to find that that loan period is different from state to state but we want to put things in people's hands and not just show them something through a demonstration but we want to put it in their hands for a longer period of time to make sure if it really does fit kind of into the fabric of their life how, how, does it does it really apply to you day in and day out or is it something that hey for a few days it was really kind of cool but after a few days i lost interest and i just went back to what i was doing before again helping people make informed decisions on what type of technology best meets their needs um, we also offer alternative financing if you're not connected to a to vr or another funding service or funding source um, a lot of state AT programs or other entities within your particular state or territory will offer what's referred to as alternative financing. Um, and so alternative financing is a great way uh, for you to be able to purchase your own assistive technology. Those programs vary from state to state on how they operate and how much money you might be able to borrow to purchase the things that you're looking to borrow. Um, but it's certainly something to inquire about um, if you aren't connected to a funding source and want to um, connect uh, with being able to purchase your own assistive technology. We also operate reuse programs. Um, so reuse programs, um, basically, you know, they might take in donated, you know, DME, um, wheelchairs, canes, crutches, walkers, all sorts of different assistive devices and technologies. Uh, we also here in Indiana, we take in computers and give 250 computers away a year to folks with disabilities who live in the state of Indiana. Um, they operate reuse programs because a lot of times folks have technology, their needs change, they don't know what to do with it, or the families don't know what to do with it. Well, they can give it to us um, as programs, and then we will fix it up, clean it up, um, refurbish it, and give it away to folks who have a need for that type of equipment. If you're, I know this is kind of a more of a national um, group that we're talking with, if you're looking for your state AT program, the links that are on the page um, will help you kind of learn more about what a state AT program is and or connect with your local state AT program. And so I'm um, going to see Laura's put some some information in there about what they offer as far as alternative financing programs. Again, those are all going to look a little bit different. We all operate a little bit different. We're all a part of, you know, some are at, at higher education. Um, places. Some are standalone nonprofits. Some are built into state government. Uh, we all look a little bit different, but we offer some core services across every state and every territory. So definitely learn more about your state AT programs. Another place I want to encourage folks to get to know, um, these are great partners with us. We talk to them a lot. Um, Job Accommodation Network, they have a lot of online resources. 
um, for employers, first and foremost, um, but also for employees as well. Um, and a couple of things I'll tease out for you that's on their website um, is you can look up SOAR, which is a searchable online accommodation resource. And what they do is they break down accommodations by disability, by topic, or by limitation. Um, so they call it A to Z. Um, it's just a really helpful. They don't get into specific recommendations, but they do help generate ideas, things to think about based on the person's disability, based on the topic, based on a limitation. What do you need to be thinking about as an employer or an employee about accommodations? Um, it doesn't take away the need for going out there and being in person and being able to kind of look at a particular situation and accommodate a particular situation, but it does help get the wheels turning um, with what are some possible solutions? What are the things I need to be thinking about as I work with an individual, work with an employee um, to be able to bring forth those accommodations? Um, they're really great. Um, their services are free um, and it's, it's a really um, great starting point for a lot of things um, in the accommodation uh, world. And then another great thing with Jan and where I've kind of used it with employers is sometimes employers are a little slow to want to hire someone with especially maybe more of a complex disability um, because they're afraid of the cost. Um, I don't know. Can I accommodate? Is this going to work? How do I make this work? Jan's got some great resources for employers. And again, sometimes just the, hey, this has worked in the past thing can really kind of get the employer on board and, and make it a little easier for them to make that decision. Uh, I know there's laws in place. I know there's, you know, do the right thing. Brian kind of mentioned earlier. But there's ways around those things if employers really kind of want to. So uh, just giving them a tool and letting them know these things are possible, not just by me or Brian or a member of my team saying so, but by actually kind of seeing how to make those things work uh, can sometimes really make a difference in, in well, their decision to even hire an individual with disability or, or, uh, or kind of, you know, make that commitment and that decision. So. Absolutely. Um, last resource I just want to share with you, um, like the rest of the world, the assistive technology industry, our, our assistive technology world has kind of been revolutionized by smart devices and apps, whether it's the iPhone, you have an, you have an iPhone, you have an Android device, you have a tablet, you have a computer. There are lots of different, apps and devices out there um, that you can connect with to be able to accomplish different tasks. And as we went through those scenarios, we brought up a lot of those, seeing AI, you know, th th all those different things are all different apps that you can just download for free um, to be able to put on your phone, your tablet, uh, to be able to get a lot of great things done for you. The issue with that is there's a lot of apps and what you're doing is you're trying to find one that's very specific for you and your need. Uh, and so a couple of places that I would encourage folks to get to know um, would be Apple Viz. Uh, Apple Viz, it says Apple in the name. They know a lot about different Apple apps. They have different forums you can be a part of. You can ask lots of questions about different things for Apple, but they also talk about Android as well. Uh, and so um, if you are blind or visually impaired, and you're wanting to kind of learn or learn more about different apps um, and has, ask questions to folks who have answers, um, Apple Viz is a great, great uh, place to be able to start and to become a part of some of their forums. Um, they give a lot of great information. They have a lot of um, people who are part um, or connected to that organization in those forums that can provide lots of really firsthand, first world experience using some of those apps and maybe some of the issues that you might run across. And so I would encourage folks to check out AppleViz. Another organization that we've gotten to know really well for a couple of different reasons is Bridging Apps. Um, Bridging Apps does a really great job uh, with helping you kind of sort through the wonderful, overwhelming world of apps. And so Bridging Apps is actually a part of an Easter Seals affiliate. It's the Houston Easter Seals, the, the Greater Houston Easter Seals affiliate. Here in Indiana, we're based, we're housed. Um, our in data program and our clinical program, we are an Easter Seals affiliate as well. So we know this group well, but I'm telling you, they're tools for helping vet or find apps that meet a very specific need um, are really kind of, in my opinion, unmatched. Um, they will help you kind of drill down between Android and Apple um, and different needs. Um, you, you've got a really great search tool that can kind of hone in on the different things that might 
be helpful for the particular individual or yourself um, and the things that you might need. Uh, and so bridging apps would be a great, great place. Um, I think there are search engines called Insignio, um, but it's a really great way to be able to find and vet apps. The other thing I love about this particular company um, or this particular entity is you aren't getting manufacturer um, information about how wonderful their app is. Um, these are actually parents, family members, persons with disabilities who are chiming in and telling you about the pros and cons for each of those apps. And so I would encourage you to look up bridging apps um, as an option um, to be able to look if you're if you're considering an app or you're looking for an app that might work for a particular person or an individual. Think about looking at bridging apps. Um, they do a really great job helping you kind of sort through all of those. So it looks like we got just a few minutes left, and I do want to leave some time for questions for folks in case they have them. So uh, just in conclusion, to, to kind of wrap everything up and kind of maybe, I don't know, hit the main bullet points of everything we talked about today, which, geez, when you bring it that small, we've really been babbling for a long time, Brian. Um, I mean, really, accommodations can make a workplace more inclusive. And, and that's, you know, as an employer uh, and as someone who conducts job interviews and does these kind of things, I want as many people to apply as possible. And I want, you know, as as diverse of a workforce as I can possibly get. Individuals with disabilities are part of having a diverse uh, workforce. Um, effective job accommodations can identify supports to achieve the job goals, the company performance standards, and sometimes those accommodations and supports don't just help the individual with disability, but could be used by other employees in order to kind of be able to uh, be more successful. Uh, kind of, as I said at the beginning, the barriers to success presented are much more important than the actual disability itself. Um, it really, where are supports needed? Where are those barriers? Not focusing so much on the diagnosis. Um, and then communication is key to avoiding setbacks and prolonging the accommodation process. Uh, as Brian said, it's very ironic that in a world where there's 90 ways, I think, to get a hold of me right now between, I mean, that's okay, that's a little high. But anyway, between email, between text messages, between all these different ways of communication, that this is usually where mistakes happen and where things break down is in that communication kind of part. So um Kind of in summary, uh, there are just some information there, uh, kind of how you can reach out to us if you would like. But we did want to leave, I guess, five minutes. Wow, I went by fast. Uh, leave a little bit of time for questions. So if you guys do have questions, I think you can throw them down in the chat and we'll more than happily try to try to get those uh, answered. But just in case time does run short and, and we do kind of this does get wrapped up. I do want to thank everyone who attended today, not just for attending and listening, but really for for talk for participating in the ex, in the experiment well, in the different um, scenarios and everything. Your ideas were great. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I see one question come up. What is our, our podcast? So we have assistive technology update, which is our flagship podcast, the one that I actually host. We've been on the air for a little over 12 years. Uh, and it's a uh, kind of interview based kind of uh, podcast. So we interview uh, manufacturers of assistive technology, thought leaders in the field, uh, providers, kind of all other kinds of folks. And you can find all of our podcast assistive technology update, accessibility minute, and assistive technology frequently asked questions all either at eastersealstech.com or most podcast providers, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher. I'm sure I'm forgetting a ton of them there, but I, I think really, it's there's really not a place you can't find it, but yeah. Yep. Yep. It should show up pretty much any of those places. So if you do have questions, um, put those in the chat. You know, I often tell folks, you know, we have, we have a lot of answers, um, but the really great thing is we're a part of a bigger bigger world, neighborhood, if you will, um, where if we don't have answers, we probably know someone who does. And that's why we enjoy getting to know Laura. She's got lots of answers too. We, we're a part of a whole network of Assistive Technology Act programs and or um, you know, providers. And when we run across difficult situations, we're not, we're not hesitant to reach out and figure something out together because the end goal is to be able to meet the needs of that person. So thank you so much. Thank you both. This was great. Um, hopefully it generated a lot of creativity and some ideas uh, from everyone who attended. And I love watching all the answers pop into chat. Those were great to see the different ideas and where everything, where people took it.
especially the different scenarios and the flexibility in not giving all the information. So are there any questions that we've got? Uh, otherwise, um, please keep in mind, you will see a survey once this webinar closes. You'll also get a reminder email tomorrow. Um, we can make the uh, handout available. Um, if you if folks would like that, we can send that out. Um, I'll ask Brian or Josh to send that along with, and we can PDF that. And then it will be recorded and archived on the YouTube channel within a few weeks. So I'm not seeing any other questions, but uh, we really, really appreciate your time today. And it's always great hearing the clever ideas and, and seeing that engagement in the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Take care.